Hello and welcome back to the channel. My name's Dr. James Gill and you've joined me for 155,000 subscriber Q&A. Uh, we've been a little bit late getting this one off the board, but unfortunately things have been rather busy at home. Um, as you can see, I'm not in the usual location for filming things here, but uh, largely that's because, as you're all aware, we've now got a baby on the way and, uh, well, life is being turned upside down relatively rapidly. So we put out the uh, uh, offer for questions for yourself and we've got quite a few questions, many of them very interesting, as far as I'm concerned anyway. The thing about these Q&A sessions is that I haven't read over the questions before um, we go through them, so they're not pre-prepared answers as it were, which makes it at least uh, more interesting from my side because I get to see what you guys are wanting to know, but also you guys have to put up with me arming and ahhing as I work my throat way through the answers. So, with that in mind, let's get on with things. So, first up, um, Vickle Miss, who is a regular poster on the channel here, says, so happy for both you and Beth announcing your nose. Uh, do you think that having all that medical knowledge makes experiencing pregnancy more terrifying? Uh, really hope it's all going well with you and you're both able to enjoy the calm before the storm. Yes, without a shadow of a doubt. Yes. Um, Beth doesn't get much choice with regard to engaging with a pregnancy because, well, it, it's there inside her. For myself, um, I am in many ways keeping myself a little bit more distant from the actual bump. You know, I'm reading to it and talking to it and doing all the things that I'm supposed to. But at the same time, I'm also frantically aware the number of patients, having worked in OBS and Gynae myself, the number of patients who lose babies at advanced pregnancy stages and things like that. I know it sounds daft to say it, um, but I will be happier when we're a bit further through the pregnancy in a bit more of a, a safer space. Uh, until then, yes, there is definitely a burden of knowledge um, and it does add to some of the stress, I think. Yeah, as I say, we're trying to be honest with these. Okay, um, Friendzone75 said, have you looked into medical uh, explanations slash studies of ASMR? Uh, do you have any interest in how it manifests? Would you ever do a video to discuss it? Uh, I wouldn't, uh, I know it's not something you always wanted to be tied to, but I feel more a scientific study of ASMR might be an interesting topic for you in one of these videos. Well, actually, um, oh, Cass has just jumped here onto the uh, side with me. Hey, old man, hey, 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 you okay? Oh dear. Yes, you see, somebody's not been well of late and he's uh, yeah, had to go off to the vet, which he did not enjoy. Um, you see, Dakar's now 16 years old um, and he's got a few grey bits on him and uh, yeah, it's, it's a wee bit worrying to me of late. But he's really not happy about the shaved patch on his fur, but it's growing back. Yeah. Taking this one to the vets is not a pleasant experience. Okay, you're going to sit there and let me get on. Okay, I've got to finish this Q&A video. All right. <laughs> I'll take that lack of running off as consent. So, let's carry on then. Um, I did a, um, a, a collaboration video um, that I'll put a link there to. Um, with uh, one of the other uh, YouTubers, one of the uh, big cardiology consultants, um, and I did a little bit of research into it. Um, broadly, when we're talking about ASMR, there seems to be a similar connection to frisson, that sort of feeling of, you know, of someone walking over your grave or the, the sense that you might feel when, with a big song, something like that. Um, perhaps some people would do for their national anthem or maybe a big song in a religious um, uh, place. Um, there's not a huge amount of evidence out there, but you know, depending on how it is that people are using ASMR you know, for relaxation, anxiety and things like that, there's definitely room for further research to be done to look if it's something that can be added into our arsenal with regard to CBT and mindfulness and things like that from a medical perspective.
Resub says, what was the most difficult part of medical school? What advice uh, would you give to someone who's considering entering the medical field? At this precise moment in time, certainly in the UK, don't. Um, I think the hardest part about medical school is the lack of time. So I went to Warwick Medical School, so that's an accelerated four-year course rather than normal five that we have. And that was the one thing I was aware of completely whilst doing it. We lacked time. And I think that's a big thing that you need to be excellent at time management, which I'm not, and you need to be very fast on your feet in terms of uh, being able to absorb knowledge, which I'm not particularly, um, and you need to be able to manage the intense pressure that comes with that. Um, I think the one thing that I would say for such a huge decision as joining medical school, um, there will be a million and one people who will tell you reasons why you should. Talk to the people who say you shouldn't and ask them why they're saying that. Particularly someone who's already in the medical field, would they do it again? I think that's probably the best way to view such a momentous decision. You know, you need to weigh the positive um, um, opinions on going to medical school also with the negatives and see whether or not you feel that you'd be able to balance those two and find what you think is a reasonable um, um, outcome for yourself. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm going to mangle this name. Uh, Paniot Sir Savis says, can you describe your first months of marriage in one word? Complete. And I think what I mean by that is uh, you're no longer planning a wedding, which I fully put my hands up and say that I perhaps didn't do the lion's share of that on. Um, but also, you know, you've you've gone through that step and you get to relax for a little bit. That doesn't mean take your eye off the ball, but it does mean that you can enjoy each other and the lives that you've chosen to have together. Although in our situation, it appears that that enjoyment has been relatively short lived on our own because there will be three before long. Justin Biddle, 1288, asks Will you and Beth do any fetus development videos throughout the pregnancy? Even if Beth's not involved, it would be a really neat way to showcase how the pregnancy would affect the usual routines. Um, I'm not sure if we're necessarily going to do any embryology side of things because A, it's visually scary for people. Um, and it's quite challenging, um, medically speaking. It was always an area I struggled at the medical school. We do have a couple of videos planned. Um, and actually, the next one we're going to be doing is uh, we're at the stage where we can actually detect the fetal heartbeat now. So we're going to be doing a video on that, certainly. Um, but a lot of it will depend on, as with all things, how much time we've got, because um, well, the pregnancy doesn't slow down depending on how bad my work schedule is. So we'll see what's appropriate for the stages as we are. So Daniel Lag um, seven seven ninety asks, do you have any tips slash study tips, especially when you have to approach a difficult, not likable topic at medical school? If that makes sense. Um, they say the best way to understand a subject is to teach it. So um, I always find it's effective to work in revision groups and you each um, take a topic that you do not want to do or you find difficult. And it's your job to do a five, 10 minute presentation to the group on the basics of it, how to understand it, and you know, uh, perhaps include a case study with that as well. It's very easy for us to sit in our comfort zones when we're revising, particularly at medical school, and avoid the topics that you don't like. I've just highlighted I'm not a fan of embryology. But if you force yourself to uh, revise it because you're giving that knowledge to somebody else, it changes your impetus to do it and well, makes, you, makes you force your way into that subject. Um, and that was something that we did quite a lot of explaining topics to each other. J Taylor four five one zero asks, "How many takes did it do for you and your wife to film the baby announcement slash pregnancy checkup video?" Uh, honestly, I was quite surprised it only took us two attempts to get it. And as far as bloopers are concerned, um, honestly, there aren't really any. The problem being, that I've only got so much space on my hard drive, um, and 
because I'm filming in 4K, most videos coming in about 50 to 80 gigabytes. So I don't really have the ability to cut out the outtakes and save them for, you know, use later, using later on. But maybe one day if I get some extra hard drive space. Ratlord Alley asks, what do you think are some of the most interesting, exciting advancements being made in medicine? Uh, honestly, there's the um, so much work being done on the gut microbiome at the moment, and uh, you know, generalised gut health. And so, for example, there's two things that I find particularly interesting. There's uh, information with regard to the prebiotics, the things that our gut bacteria feed on, and our probiotics, the supplementation of microbes that we can have to try and improve people's gut microbiome. And for example, there is research being done on sourdoughs where people have found to have an increased level of prebiotics on their hands and things for making the sourdoughs, and that might translate to positive health benefits. Note I'm talking about the food that our own bacteria consume rather than the bacteria themselves because those probiotics are still going to be killed in the cooking process. One of the other things that I think is particularly interesting about gut microbiome medicine is I firmly believe in maybe 10, 15 years, rather than giving medications for depression and anxiety to specific mental health things, I'm not meaning broadly, I think it's possible that we may be looking at altering diets, and because the pharmaceutical companies will want to continue making money, possibly giving prescriptions of probiotics to try and increase serotonin production in the bowel and things from that side of things. So a very interesting field that will probably be affecting us all before too long. Uh, Jovental asks, so for editing your own videos, what's your biggest frustration you have with the editing? Uh, honestly, because I'm colourblind, I kind of get that wrong quite often. So that's one area that I struggle with. But um, I think things are gradually improving. Uh, not perfect, but we are getting there. Jared Dunham 6447s asks, would you ever do a deep dive video on the biology of an Adeptus Astartes or their enhancement? Well, actually, it's on the job list to do. I was contacted by uh, another YouTuber asking if um, you know I'd like to work with them to do that. And when I was at university, I was at Nottingham, so I was very lucky that Games Workshop's headquarters was actually my local store. Um, and I still have friends who actually work for GW today. Um, so yes, I think that in the fullness of time, there may be a trip to Games Workshop with some cameras, if we can get their permission, because apparently they're very specific about taking cameras um, in there. Um, and then yes, we, we might be able to do something fun on that side of things, looking at you know space marines and their f fictional biology, certainly. Uh, the Fleming family, uh, 22, asked, what's your thoughts on becoming a first-time dad? I'm not even remotely ready or mature enough. Um, I presume that everybody has feelings such as that, but uh, yeah, we're, we're, we're going to see, but uh, it, it's something I'm honestly anxious, very, very anxious about. Um, and part of that is, you know, things from my own history that I don't want to repeat on a child, which I think everybody will say similar things like that. But, uh, yeah, um, I'm sure we'll be filming things to do with the pregnancy and perhaps um, childhood. Um, yeah, watch this space. There's, there's lots of medical stuff to do with paediatrics. And, uh, yeah, finally I'll have a small creature to perhaps utilise for teaching with. So we'll see. Arvid5055 said, Hey, I'm starting medical school next fall and was wondering how much I'm going to be able to rely on coffee to study through sleepless nights before exams, or will I need stronger stuff? Now, bear in mind my medical degree seemed to be sponsored by Red Bull. Um, I am aware of the hypocritical side of this when I say that. Do not do the sleepless nights and do not rely on caffeine. Uh, why on earth am I saying something like that? Well, ultimately, passing your exams and knowledge retention is about getting information in your brain. Um, and that requires REM cycles in your sleep um, in order to get better restoration and memory formation. 
Um, caffeine will interfere with adenosine, stopping you going to sleep in the first place, and will significantly impact on the number of REM cycles you'll get. So let's say you stay up three, four hours later revising with the use of caffeine. You're probably going to do more than three, four hours worth of damage to the uh, memory that you're trying to, that the memories you're trying to form from that revision period than actually if you concentrate on getting that seven hours a night sleep. Um, now, yes, whilst I'm through medical school, I still have to do teaching, uh, teaching at the medical school now. I still have to do my own prep. And frequently there will be a new subject that I'm having to cover with regard to a lecture or a, a new medicine stuff comes out that perhaps I've had to research before a consultation. In those situations, I have actively changed my revision process and I am trying incredibly hard not to work late into the night when I need to utilise my memory. Yes, I'm not very good at switching off, particularly when it comes to getting work done, but if it's in terms of getting it into my head, then I do try very firmly to switch off and make sure I'm getting my seven to eight hours sleep a night. So really try not to do the caffeine and cram because actually it won't work very well in the long term for you. Chuck O'Neill2023 uh, says, um, are doctors really the worst patients? Um, I, I'm not sure that doctors are necessarily the worst patients per se. I think in my experience dealing with other doctors, the problem is that when I'm asking a patient who is not from a medical background questions, I get answers in the order that I am asking them, so how I have my internal workings. However, when you're dealing with a patient who is also a medic, obviously we want to be helpful. So we give information that we know or feel is relevant. But as the person receiving that information, it can be out of the order I normally think in. So on that side of things, it sometimes means that medics can be um, a little bit more of a challenge. But there is also the issue of um, imposter syndrome. I remember when I saw um, one of my colleagues who had trained me um, you know, in anaesthetics when I was at Warwick Hospital. Now, as far as I'm concerned, anaesthetics are like the best of the best at medicine. You know, they know everything. You know, this person came in with their child, you know, and I basically sort of my brain screamed and ran out of the door and I said look what do you want I will do it you know I'm, I'm terribly sorry you know I'm, I'm not worthy her and he looked at me and said I'm a gas man my child's broken I don't know what's wrong fix it so sometimes we can cause ourselves problems when it comes to uh, treating medics as well and that goes back to the the constant mantra it's vitally important that we treat all patients equally and as the patient first and foremost. O'Garlo says, do general practitioners, specialists or medical doctors who work with patients read research papers as part of their usual activities? Yes, so BMJ comes through the door very regularly and it's basically a way of overviewing what's going on with research and then often they do specific um, research articles in there that uh, you know might be outside your field that might still be interesting. But yes, it's vitally important that we keep up to date because well, the world is changing, medicine is changing, science is changing. I believe there's, um, there's a statistic that by the time you leave medical school, 25% of what you were taught there is actually out of date. By the time you finish your training, 50% of what you were taught at medical school is out of date. So it's vitally important that we do keep in, uh, engaged with research and the changes in our fields. All about helping the patient at the end of the day. Uh, Josh Marshall, uh, 1054, asks, do you have a favourite song? Just curious what you jam out to on a usual day. Honestly, it depends on what I'm doing. If I'm cycling uh, and I'm doing a heavy workout, um, I actually quite like listening to, I've forgotten who's done it now, but there's a, a dance version of Dying of the Light, and I think it's actually narrated by Michael Caine, and it's a really good one to knuckle down and get that power out. Conversely, if I'm just relaxing, I tend to... Um, you know, actually like Bare Naked Ladies, they're, they're a group who just sound happy. Um, and on that same note, um, uh, Scouting for Girls, 
Uh, one sounds like a younger version than the other. Again, it's a, a, a band who sound like they know they've won the lottery and they're enjoying doing what they do. But if I'm working, I can't have music with words in it because it distracts me. So often listening to theme tunes and things like that, so Gladiator, um, Lord of the Rings, Jurassic Park, you know, basically you know, the, the big film scores. That, that's my working music, certainly. Uh, CMW asks, Hi Dr Gill, what's the most frustrating part of her job? I don't have enough time and I don't have enough brain. Uh, it's simply, it, I wish that I knew more um, and I wish that I had more time to do more with the little bit of knowledge that I've got to help the patients. Um, and it's one of the reasons why I've, um, you know, doing the sports medicine clinic um, but, uh, on the, on the private side so I can give that extra time that's needed to work through those really complex things. I wish I could be doing it on the NHS but it's not something that we can um, afford in the UK nationally so it's something that I'm doing myself that way. <laughs> William Winder 5011 has just put in the grim dark of humanity's far future there is only war. I'm not sure that's a question but it perhaps might be rather predictive. Okay. Final one, uh, oh, uh, Friendly O, oh, why do anaesthetists need so many blood tests before an operation? What are they for? I'm going for surgery, not major soon, and on Monday I'm having my sixth sample of blood. Actually, this is a really good question because it's a question that patients often ask me, why am I asking for extra blood tests? Having blood taken is like going to the supermarket. If somebody didn't ask you to pick up milk, then you won't have brought the milk back with you. And it's the same thing with a blood test. If someone hasn't needed to ask for a, um, a calcium level at that point, but then there's a change to the medications which can affect calcium, then suddenly you need to get that blood test and it won't have been done before. Bear in mind, you can't just test for everything because tests cost money. And I've been astonished uh, when doing sort of the background work um, how much blood tests cost. So an HbA1c, a test I do all the while, costs like 50 quid. You know, this is not, you know, cheap things. And I, I personally think it would be a really good idea for patients to have the price written beside both the tests that we're requesting and the prescriptions that they're getting. Not so that we get them to pay it, not at all, but so that they understand the value that we're getting from the NHS. So six blood tests because they need to know different things and different blood tests may open different questions. Similarly, some blood tests are only valid for a short period of time, particularly with regard to anaesthetics, where we need to have the most up-to-date information in order to keep the patient as healthy as possible whilst that surgery might be going on. Well, I hope that's been um, a reasonable Q&A uh, session for you. Um, if there's any other bits that you, uh, you're interested in, stick them in the comments below, particularly with any ideas on uh, further videos that we might be able to do. One of the things that I'd be very interested from your perspective is um, I am aware that I have literally uh, run out of time. My entire week is packed and some days I'm doing seven days. Um, I am thinking about setting up uh, a Patreon here um, in order to be able to do more YouTube videos because actually I I think that I'm probably helping more people than I do in a day in clinic some days. Now in terms of doing that, A, what do you guys think about doing that? The only reason why I say uh, I'm thinking about setting up a Patreon is I will need to stop a day's or half a day's work somewhere else in order to do more filming. So that's one of the reasons for that. But what would you guys get out of that in terms of a Patreon? Well, I like, often fail, to do four videos a month. So ideally, uh, a clinical examination video, a deep dive video, something a little bit like this, a, a talky video. But then I was thinking of the fourth video of the month would be something that A, the Patreon users would be able to decide upon and when you know people have suggested four or five different topics, um, those topics could be voted on by the Patreon so that you're actually having a direct impact on what topics we're doing. 
um, that might allow us to do topics that perhaps aren't as friendly to the YouTube algorithm. So, for example, we've had people who have asked, you know, very good video topics, things like um, uh, chronic regional pain syndrome and, you know, small um, topics in terms of YouTube, but hugely important for people. Um, at the end of the day, this is, you know, I, need, I am beholden to the YouTube algorithm to some degree, so those slightly more esoteric videos I've not been able to do, but with support from Patreon, it may actually be that we can ignore the algorithm and do at least uh, more of the videos that you guys want and similarly you guys would vote for. Um, if there's any other things that you think would make Patreon a reasonable um, consideration for yourselves, I'd be really grateful for you to put that down in the comments below. I'm not, I haven't decided that's what we're going to do, um, but ultimately I need to try and find more time in order to be able to do this. So that's perhaps the only option we've got at the moment. With that in mind, thank you for watching this far. Please consider liking the videos and, and subscribing. We've got a really good little community here um, and I'm proud of the positivity that you guys show at times. Um, and, you know, and have a look at some of the comments. Genuinely, that they're wonderful. People coming back after years to check how somebody else is doing after they put a comment that on a medical thing that they're experiencing. So, yeah, th this is a wonderful place, and thank you for my ability to be part of that with you. Well, take care, and uh, we'll see you in the next one. Cheerio.